On tonight's One Show, we're live at the Invictus Games with Prince Harry. We visit a gigantic greenhouse filled with 140 million tomatoes. And we're going to give these two a chance to avenge the biggest nemesis of their Spandau Ballet career. What? We forgot to mention that bit. Sorry. What is it? Who? What? Yeah, looking very smart, both of you. So, what was the biggest failure of your musical career back in the 80s? The biggest failure? Yes, come on. Yeah, come on. You know what it was? Pop quiz. Yes, it was. <laughs> yes, it was. He was yes, getting beaten by Duran Duran on the pop quiz. Yes. Your, your arch rivals at the time, 1984. Let's go back to that moment. Spider Valley 40, Duran Duran 52. So thank you very much and good night. Oh, oh, oh that, that wink. Does that wink still hurt? Yes, yeah. it does actually. It hurts watching it. And there's a terrible cold moment. This is from the movie now, isn't it? No, I know. Of there's course it is. Well, let's let's relive it today. We're going to give you a chance to, to, to exercise all those those questions that you got wrong. Try and get them right tonight because Mike Reed is here with us. Come on. <laughs> Hey, you right? hey, hey. So, my hey. pop Good. quiz, I mean, you know, it's tea time, Saturday nights. How many views did you used to get? Um, we got 10 million every week. Um, 10 million every week? 10 million at tea time? You were just warming up then, weren't you, oh, really? Oh, we were just getting into our stride, yeah. But it was great fun. I mean, it really was because, you know, you saw everyone in a different habitat, didn't you, really? You weren't being interviewed. You weren't performing. It was like, mm, this is slightly out of the comfort zone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So was this the biggest battle you ever saw? Spandau Ballet versus Duran Duran? Yeah, if you'd gone back to the 60s, it would have been the Stones versus the Beatles. Uh, so it was of that magnitude. The real problem uh, was for the editors, because every time one of these guys or Duran opened their mouths, the place was screamed down. <laughs> so the editor, how do I get in to do the score? You know, it was impossible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So did you have as much fun afterwards, because it, the, as you did on screen, did you all hang out afterwards? Sometimes, yeah, it depends, I think, what you were doing. I remember being, I think, being stopped by a policeman at three in the morning in the King's Road with a couple of Slade clinging to my car. Oh, uh, that's <laughs> going to be good. Oh, yeah, there, was, there, was, there were a few, a few moments. But you never yeah. did just two bands, did you? It was usually a mixture of musicians. Always a mixture. It was the only time we did a band against a band. Wow. Yeah, and there were people on it that you wouldn't get on a panel show. I mean, people like Morrissey, Bob Geldof, you wouldn't normally get them on panel. Okay, now, yeah. you know, after, yes. after, the, after the fact, these two claimed that they knew the answers, they were just too slow on the buzzers. So tonight, we're going to ask you the same questions. No need for buzzers at all. Nope. Okay, oh, however, okay. if you get a question wrong, we're going to show this photograph as many times as we can. <laughs> if you get the question right, so then you're okay. So who's being Duran Duran? There is no Duran Duran. It's just me and Gary. No excuses to that. Okay. Simon and Nick, if you're watching, I'm sorry already. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, now, if you've ever struggled with your tomato plants at home, we may have found a solution for you. Who hasn't? It turns out all you need is a huge <laughs> sugar factory and a giant greenhouse. Chef, how do you say this, Mike? Uh, Andasio. Andasio. It's very good, all this. I uh, went to Norfolk to get the freshest ingredients for the perfect ketchup. Come on, ketchup. Ketchup. <laughs> we produce millions of tons of sugar every year using homegrown sugar beet. But making it isn't a simple process. It takes a huge amount of energy with a lot of wasted heat. Normally, there's no use for all that excess heat, but one sugar factory in Norfolk is doing things very differently. They're using it to grow 140 million tomatoes. Slap bang next to the sugar factory, this massive greenhouse covers nearly 45 acres, or about 25 football pitches. So how are you growing so many? Because I've only managed to grow one in my greenhouse this year. What we're able to do is take the heat and the carbon dioxide from the sugar factory and pump that into here. And that actually adds about double the yield. So it's the carbon dioxide that gives you double the yield. And the heat as well. We need, right. we need both of them. So these are really sweet. Is that because of the freshness? They're so fresh. Because we're based in the UK, 
we're actually able to get these tomatoes to the store in a day or two. Whereas if you were buying an imported tomato, actually it will still be on a boat before that's even got into your house. So I'll put these into the fridge as soon as I get home? Absolutely not. If you put them in the fridge, that ruins the taste. You should put them in the fruit bowl, because right. it's a fruit. The 400 growers, pickers and sorters here form just part of the workforce that also includes 8,500 very busy bees. They pollinate 10,000 flowers every day, while an army of macrolophus help keep those pesky whitefly at bay. You need a head for heights to work here, as these are super-sized tomato plants. Wow! This is amazing, isn't it? It's a hell of a view. As we get to the top, we're actually going to drop the plant so that they're at the right height for picking our tomatoes later. Right. Just like that. Simple as that. Simple as that. Time to get back to what I know, cooking. And what could be better than my special ketchup? Having some tomatoes like this just picked off the vine today, I mean, what could be better than that? You could add your own spices. I mean, I've used lots of different flavours here. I'm throwing in cinnamon, tomato puree, mace, bay leaves, cloves, basil and red wine vinegar. Look at that, lovely. After being pureed and sieved, it's ready to serve. As easy as that, your very own homemade tomato ketchup. I wonder if anyone fancies a burger. There you go guys, now you're on your lunch break. There's a burger each, and you might want to try some of that. Right guys, your tomatoes, my recipe, what's the verdict? Both are fantastic, Ricky. Nice one. Can't ask for more than that, I'm going to get stuck in myself. Isn't it? That ketchup is it good? off the scale. It's yeah, very on, sweet, sing. very sweet. Isn't it? It's like a meal it's in itself. It's very special. And mm. Ricky's recipe That's amazing. is yeah. on our website, nice. isn't it, Chris? Yes. Mm. I'm more of a brown sauce man. Are you? Yeah. yeah. We were going to ask that, but we didn't have time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. said in the meeting. Let's cross live to the Invictus Games now, where Prince Harry and his mates are about to take part in a game of murder ball. Ooh. Our man in the middle of the mayhem is Iwan. Do you know what? It's absolutely electric in it. It's like 2012. This is serious. You've got Sir Clive Woodward, he's one of the managers, and the other team, Johnny Wilkinson. They're taking it seriously. Mike Tyndall down here. Now listen, Harry was on our show, and he said he's worried about you. You're going to take him out. You're going to be a bit rough with him. I have decided that I'm quite happy to sacrifice the Simbin to see what needs to be done, be done. This is up your street murder ball. You look, you look aggressive, you're aggressive on the rugby pitch and they must be scared about you, Mike. People always say my face fits crime watch, so murder ball <laughs> is the right, probably the right sport for me. Well, you're on the right channel for it. Listen, don't hold back, just be as aggressive as you can. We're looking forward to this. you can deal down in yeah, just don't, jeans, yeah, yeah, I know, don't come near me. <laughs> now, ex-staff sergeant, Hello, sergeant, yeah, sergeant yeah, Kelly sergeant. Holmes, mm -hmm. we know how gutsy you are on the athletics track. Have you ever done anything like this, though? I haven't, but we had a practice and it's absolutely brilliant. So much fun. We need Mike to get his horns out though. He needs to stop being gentle giant. He's got to get there now. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure it means nothing. Just have a great time out there tonight. Ben, ben Still, yeah. you're the captain of this riff raff. Yeah. Are they any good? Yeah, yeah. We're, go we're going to win it, definitely. We're going to come out uh, on top, winning gold. Well, on your right-hand side there, Jason Robinson. I haven't got time to chat to you because you've got to start, but just get out there. Use that speed you've got. I'd say it's definitely going to be here. Just watch me go. Well, you get out there and warm up. Now, listen, this is going to be absolutely amazing. Now, a man who knows all about this sport, Steve Brown, he was the captain at 2012. Do they know what they're doing out there? Because this is rough. I'd like to say yes, but I think it's more of a no, to be honest with you. And They've, they've had a good go and they've had a warm-up, and uh, it's going to be exciting to watch, you know. They... They're athletes, they're sports people, they've got a good idea of what's going to be going on and let's see what happens. What about the atmosphere? I've got to say, I mean, this is like 2012, is it bringing all back for you? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely amazing. You've got the crowds here, they're as lively as they've ever been and to, to be a part of London 2012 and be kept in there and then be part of all this now, it's fantastic. And seeing the sport grow, and it's just going to keep growing. But you know what, I think it's going to be absolutely amazing. The time for us to chat is over, so let's go over to our commentator, the one, the only, Eddie Butler. Thank you, Ewan. <laughs> Sir Clive Woodward is the team manager of Endeavour in the red shirts, and Johnny Wilkinson is the manager of the Invictus in the green shirts. The man who kicked England to victory in 2003, the Rugby World Cup. And here's Jason Robinson, who played such a big part in that 2003 Rugby World Cup triumph. And we are going to have the opening goal by none other than Prince Harry. 1-0 to Invictus. 
The aim of the game is to get the ball between the cones. Mike Tyndall is on the pitch, ex-sergeant in the army, Kelly Holmes. And away comes Ayaz Buta of the GB professional wheelchair rugby team. Mike Tyndall overrunning. And if he goes out of bounds, it's automatic. Well, it's not automatically, but uh, he has to be careful where he comes back into play. Number five for the green team is Dennis Denker of the Danish Invictus Games team. Harry Wales, pass forward to Jim Roberts, one of the pros, Ayaz Buta on the red team, Jim Roberts on the green team, 2-0, team Invictus lead. Ayaz Buta, contact wheelchair to wheelchair is not only allowed, it is positively encouraged. Buta escapes the last pitch tackle of Prince Harry, opening score for Endeavour, 2-1, Invictus lead. Jason Robinson, as elusive on four wheels, perhaps, as he was on two legs, and away comes Dennis Denker. Denmark took bronze in the wheelchair rugby, the grand final to come. Do you know what? This is absolutely electric. I can't believe Prince Harry opened the scoring, so make sure you come back to us later. I've got to say, though, I'd love to see Alex and Chris out there go into battle. Back to you. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'd say stick with it, to be honest. I mean, I know we got the Spandau boys here, but that was gripping, wasn't it? Was, it? Yeah. Really good. <laughs> Prince yeah. Harry looked so chuffed when he got the ball, didn't he? Yeah, I mean, yeah. hats off to Harry as well for bringing all this together. Yeah, Harry's it's heroes. a brilliant thing to, to organise, isn't it? Yeah. Now then, your documentary, Soul Boys of the Western World, so it documents the rise of Spandau Ballet right from the beginning to the bitter end, really, doesn't mm. it? Yeah. And you gave the job to somebody else to put together. So it was only recently, when it was all finished, that you saw it. So what did you make of it then? Yeah, it was tough viewing, actually, yeah, as a band. Really. You know, there's, uh, she really found within all this archive a story about friendship and how that can break down and about relationships, really. It's a sort of bromance, but when you're watching it, and of course, if anyone who knows the story, we, we, we ended up in court together and really quite a bitter breakup, and uh, that's all in there. And it's just voiceovers from the five of us, and we did it all individually without knowing what anyone else was saying. Right. You, know, you know what it kind of reminds me of, in a way? You know, um, you know a Senna documentary where you, you didn't have to be an F1 fan to actually follow it and to understand it and, and to get into it? And... And Soul Boys of the Western World is a little bit like that. You know, you don't have to be a huge Spandau fan to understand what it's about. But the thing is, all the, the, all the footage was found by this director, presumably, from fans who'd, who'd been filming him in um, interviews and different gigs. I mean, how does she find it well, all? Well, to be honest, we, we employed someone else to, to find this footage for about two years before uh, because we thought it would be great to collate mm. it all. And in the process, we, we found stuff we, we didn't even know existed. Like, there's a famous gig we did on the HMS Belfast before we were even signed in 1980 and someone had a Super 8 of that uh, and we saw that for the first time last year and then a, a film of us in our first New York trip uh, came about but we gave it all to George and she uh, then um, then we walked out of the door and I think that was the film we wanted we didn't want it to be a PR job we wanted her to find a story that it gave it um, weight uh, yeah. and what we tried not to do is turn it into just talking heads everybody went in individually and just sat in a dark room with a microphone and just got everything off their chest what yeah. was troubling them what was right what was wrong with the band and then left it to her to cut together I am the baddie at one point <laughs> <laughs> well that's okay because that means you get a chance for some kind of resolution you know to yeah. clean, cleanse the soul uh, this morning we had Jeff Lynn on the radio show, we had Earth, Earth Wind and Fire, that, and you know, they've been through similar uh, situations with their bands, and being yeah. in a band is the closest thing you get to being in a marriage, isn't it? Because yeah. in very few other walks of life do you actually split up with your work. Oh, it's uh, really weird. And it, in, in marriage terms, you got married, you got divorced, yeah. and now you get married again. Well, yeah. <laughs> but when we, when we got back together, Martin actually set a camera up in the corner of the rehearsal room when we first arrived together, and it was just rolling, and... Um, and then we play music together. And you see, we're, we're all very nervous. But then as soon as we start playing music, 
I suppose that's the, the equivalent of something else that you do when yeah. you're married. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we, you just see this I wonder what that equivalent is. Yeah. <laughs> Making sweet music. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but when we, when we got back together, Martin actually set a camera up in the corner of the rehearsal room when we first arrived together, and it was just rolling, and, um, and then we play music together. And you see, we're, we're all very nervous, but then as soon as we start playing music, I suppose that's the, the equivalent of something else that you do when yeah. you're married. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we, you just see I wonder what that equivalent is. Yeah. <laughs> Making sweet music. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Going down to ten the borders. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, for me, you know, when uh, the, the guys were in court together and we went through that really dark period, it was like watching, like being a kid and having your parents go through a divorce. Mm. It was... Good story, though. Good viewing. Fun. Compelling viewing. Mm. Well, but, you were very close at the beginning. Yeah. Because you were well, all we sitting are. in your pants listening to an early version yeah. of True. <laughs> OK, this is the moment that you knew it was going to be OK for a while. <laughs> Recording True within two or three playbacks, everyone was singing along. And I knew then that we found a song that could change our lives forever. The funny thing is, I didn't think it was a single. I thought it was a lovely song, you know. were brilliant for many things, but shorts, <laughs> that wasn't one of them. No, but we were in no. the Bahamas there. We weren't in someone's No, you weren't. You weren't in the Bahamas. <laughs> Come on. You're in Kensal Rise. <laughs> <laughs> Some party. There. All right, then. Time for our first pop quiz question. Are you okay. ready? Yeah. Mike, okay. over to you. Okay, and if you don't get it right... Pop quiz! If you don't get it right, we'll show that naked picture of you with those shopping baskets with something okay. in them hanging around your waist. Uh, right, in 1984, the year of your downfall, uh, Meatloaf, Meatloaf had a hit with Modern Girl. Who had a hit with the same title, guys? Prepare to hide the children at home. Because she's a modern girl. Yeah. Oh, I, I can't tell you that. Show the was the naked picture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The answer, Mike, what's the answer? Who was, who was it? It was Sheena Easton. Sheena oh, Easton! Oh, yeah. Oh, there is no naked picture oh, of Sheena Easton. So right. This is tough. OK, the yeah. whole rock. More questions from Mike and you to see, hopefully, from Spandau later. Well, Spandau's rise in the 1980s came at a time of tremendous change in British society, and this year marks 30 years since two groups, one fighting against change, one fighting for it, struck up a surprising friendship. The Miners' Strike, a time of great upheaval, running battles with the police, arguments between politicians, and extreme hardship for the communities involved. But in the middle of all the hostility, an unlikely alliance was formed, one that's now inspired a feature film called Pride. We raised this money because we want to help you. Everything will be all right once they start to mix. Die! Your gays have arrived! Moved by the plight of the striking miners, the lesbian and gay community in London started to raise money. The Sun newspaper called it an unholy alliance of pits and perverts, and somehow that phrase took on a life of its own. The Electric Ballroom in Camden played host to a benefit gig that raised thousands for striking miners in South Wales and Bronski Beat headlined. The gig's being recreated for the movie premiere and Jimmy Somerville is here to perform again. Jimmy, how come Bronski Beat got involved 30 years ago? What did it mean to you at the time? We felt the pain and we felt the kind of the pressure. It was also shown that we weren't just obsessed about gay politics, you know, that we weren't this kind of closed kind of group of people. We wanted to help to adopt the village and to raise money. The chosen area was Delice in South Wales, and activist Mike Jackson, who was part of Lesbians and Gays Support the Miners, made first contact. We made this decision that we were going to adopt this <laughs> poor beleaguered community in Wales, and I wrote, I was secretary of the organisation, so I wrote this letter, and I do remember just popping it in the letterbox and thinking, God, I'd love to be a fly on the wall with the other end when this gets wrong. Because, you know, we, we weren't stupid. I mean, the homophobia was rampant, it was 30 years ago. 
Sean James was married to a minor and was there when the letter arrived. Everybody burst out laughing. Really? And then we all thought, <laughs> well, why are we laughing? Uh, what's funny about it? So we said, right, well, right, that's great. So we talked about it. And there wasn't, I can't say there was any rampant homophobia, because there wasn't. We were more concerned when we heard that we'd have to provide a vegetarian <laughs> option. But when they came to visit? Oh, yeah. <laughs> The LGSM activists were invited to Delice to meet the miners they were supporting. We assembled outside the miners' welfare hall. There was about two or three hundred people in this, in this big concert room, and we opened these double swing doors, and the whole tenor of the conversation dropped. Oh, my God. And then one person started clapping, and the whole room stood up and gave us an ovation. And that was a moment in my life when everything changed. All we ever wanted was acceptance, and we got it there and then in seconds. Celebrations ensued, and Jonathan Blake showed off his moves on the dance floor. It was fantastic. It was just, they made us so welcome. You know, it was, it was a joy. There is the most wonderful photograph. Of, uh, of me dancing and Sean there, and it is, it is fantastic, absolutely amazing. Of course, the culmination of all of this was the Pits and Perverts Benefit gig. I mean, that must have been huge. Well, one and a half thousand people came to it. We raised over 5,500 quid. And you're reclaiming the kind of famous headline as well. Yeah, well, yeah. 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 One of the things that sort of gay people have always done, they've always taken things and just subverted it, inverted it. So the son wants to call us perverts, right, we'll use it, you yeah. know, with pride. The group raised over £20,000 for the miners, helping them through the strike. But after a year of severe poverty, the financial hardship took its toll and the miners voted to return to work. It was seen as a great defeat for the British trade union movement. But a shift in attitudes towards homosexuality had begun, and the miners pledged to support gays and lesbians in their struggle. Not only did they bring their banners to the Gay Pride rally in London, the miners also helped to push through gay rights policies at the 1985 Labour Party conference. When you're in a battle against an enemy so much bigger, so much stronger than you, to find out you had a friend you never knew existed, well, that's the best feeling in the world. And lifelong friendships were cemented, which have been rekindled by this film. Yeah. My friends went to see it this afternoon said it was brilliant. Oh, it looks amazing. amazing. I can't yeah, yeah it's it's really, great. really yeah. good. So you were Spanta <coughs> Ballet by 1984, the year of the minor strike. But what were you before then? Because you had many band names before and you were played different genres of music. I mean, you couldn't settle for a while, Well, could actually, you? Marty was only in a band briefly that we were called The Gentry. Yeah. Uh, but before then, when we had another bass player, we were The Makers, The Cut, The Roots, a, a school band, you know. There's an Ed, Ed Norton Modern Family sketch when he turns up and the girl says, you're not the bass player from Spandau Valley, so I'm the one between Martin Kemp and Richard Miller. Which is amazing, <laughs> Richard Miller was the kid at school that played bass for us. She Good said, knowledge. Yeah, great, and yeah, very geeky. I, I didn't know this afternoon, you knew already, but where, explain to everybody at home where the name Spandau Ballet came from. The name came from, well, we were gentry, like Gary said, mm. and then uh, we played one Saturday morning to uh, kind of like the click of London from the Blitz Club, and we didn't have a name at that point, but Robert Elms, you know, the presenter, came to us and said, listen, that name's not going to work. He had just come back from Berlin, seen the name uh, Spandau Ballet written on a toilet wall in Berlin. So odds are we stole it from somebody else. Yeah. In fact, I know we did, because in 1986, <coughs> I'm walking down a street in Islington, and this bloke comes running after me and goes, you stole our name! You stole our name! Really? <laughs> but, but we forgive you! Bad luck, mate. <laughs> but, but, some money now. Because that doesn't happen now, because as soon as a young band has an idea for a name, they have to look on MySpace and check it out yeah. on the internet, and if there's another band, then they can't yeah. use it. But, but what does it mean, though? No idea. No, yes you do, Go No, on. it's a place in Berlin. Yeah. And I know that much. Prison, I think. There's, there's a lot of ideas. It's, it, of okay, well, it let's do, we're talking about the first time you ever played Spandau Ballet with mm. the new sound. We have footage of that. This is the first time uh, Spandau played out their new sound to an invited audience. Yeah. So, anyway, here right. we go. <laughs> That rehearsal room that day was probably the most important gig we've ever played. It was such a relief to see the excitement on their faces. And I realised that morning we'd become their band. You too sort of um, 
eclectic, though, weren't you? Do you know, I mean, we had no money. We were kids. We were living at home with our mum and dad. I mean, Martin found that beret in some army surplus store. You, we just made it up as we went But you had the mid your moves going on behind the keyboard. No, he had our moves. No. <laughs> 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 All right, just for that, it's time for another pop quiz. <laughs> Okay, second question, and uh, if you don't want to see that photograph from the days before you could actually afford clothes, guys, uh, <laughs> here is a question from that year again, 1984. Which opera did Malcolm McLaren pillage in 1984? Madam Butterfly. Oh! Whoa. Yes, you're right! Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, you could show I was, was going to say, we know we're getting thousands of women saying they need to see the photograph anyhow, so... <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, the quiz, the quiz is irrelevant. They love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get an update then on how Prince Harry and his team got on in the wheelchair rugby. What have been the highlights so far, the new one? Oh, honestly, there have been so many highlights, you're missing loads, but for me, Harry scoring first, you saw that, then when you went, this was fantastic. Kelly Holmes here, Dame Kelly Holmes, no one being nice to her, look, absolutely getting smashed there, she was going to score. And no prisoners there. Everyone basically just being really rough with it. That was fantastic. And then we saw this was fantastic as well. Zara Phillips getting really stuck in here. Actually, a nice change of pace from there, and she actually sets up a goal. So it's a brilliant pass, and it's been such a tight game. But the highlight you just missed, and the whole crowd booed, was right here. Prince Harry, yes, Mr. Prince Harry himself. What have I done, Ref? What did I do, Ref? You know what you did. You got sent off. He got sent to the sin bin. He's having a smile and the crowd absolutely love that. He gets sent off, he's still in the sin bin. It's been fantastic. Steve, you've loved it, you've been with me the, the whole game. For you, who's, who's been the shine? Who's been a really good player out there? Well, to be quite honest with you, it was Prince Harry. He's been end to end, his passes have been on point, he's been defending well, been spreading the call for his teammates. It's been amazing to watch. It has been amazing. Listen, guys, make sure after the one show you flick over to BBC Two, you'll see all of the action here. It's been brilliant. Back to you. Brilliant. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Ian, indeed. OK, you have this new movie back uh, out. It's been out in a couple of weeks. It's The Rise, Fall and Rise Again of Spandau Ballet. Yeah. Um, how was it with you and the rest of the band, with them, your loyalty to them or to your brother? <laughs> it was kind of... Uh... It's what I said earlier, it was kind of like being stuck in the middle of your parents being divorced and you were just torn. Obviously, like, my loyalty was to the, my brother, my Gary as my brother, but to them as my friends. Uh, mm -hmm. I think what hurt me the most when I look back at, when I saw the film for the first time, was how little attention I gave the others uh, during that period. Because obviously it was tearing them apart the same as it was tearing Gary apart. But uh, I'm kind of pretty... When I watched the film, I'm pretty disappointed in myself as a young man. Well, I know. I think we have to say that, you know, Martin was going through, uh, you know, a, a bad health problems at yeah, the time. We but, know that. But also, you were young. Yeah. You know, yeah. you, you, yeah, you learn. You spend your whole life trying to be good on, on the drums or the guitars and singing. You learn. You, yeah. you, you teach yourself that, but nobody teaches you to be ready for success. Well, looking back yeah. on the, at the film, it feels like other people, you know. We're kids at first, you know, and it's in the beginning, the 60s and 70s, you know, we're still playing on bomb sites. But mm. there, it really didn't feel like it was me, you know. It felt like I'd maybe become someone else. All right, well, oh. th in tonight's pop quiz, by the way, uh, it's 1-0 uh, to you, so yeah. we get the sibling rivalry. <laughs> you, th okay, this last question is just for you. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah, Let's yeah. have one more round of pop quiz. <laughs> Chris, if I didn't know it then, I'm not going to now. OK, and you know, guys, uh, uh, Chris is going to share the picture anyway, so... The <laughs> <laughs> question is as irrelevant now as it was in 1984, really. Um, a television hippie in 84 had a hole in his shoe. Who had the original hit? And I know you know this. <laughs> I thought you knew this. I, thought, I don't know. You know the song. Shoe. Do you know? Hole in the shoe kept letting in water, letting Bernard in water. Ribbons by no. <laughs> you know nothing. That's a hole in the ground. <laughs> Show it, in my head. it was traffic. It was traffic. <laughs> 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 was cool How did I not know that? Traffic with the original and Neil from the Young Ones with the cover version. Neil was, yeah. Okay. Can't you give me the lyrics of Hungry Like a Wolf? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I could get that one. Thanks to Mike Reed for that. Bring it back. I say bring Hot Quiz back. To guys, the documentary Soul Boys of the Western World is in cinemas on September the 30th. OK, and this one, the final of Tumble, tomorrow, BBC One, 6, 6 o'clock. Watch that if you can. Have a great weekend. Thank you very much. Bye. Indeed. Bye.